Have you ever felt your world come crashing down all around you? Having no sense of what is going on or why things are. Have you come to a position where you've said to yourself or asked, God, why me? So as you've seen from the context, one year ago, my world changed around me. My entire way of life changed forever. I was born in Singapore on the 12th of September, September 1986. I moved with my parents to Malaysia in October 1986. Singapore for me was effectively a foreign nation. As many people here know, as a Singapore citizen, you have the obligation to serve national service. I had no such knowledge, having grown up my entire life in Malaysia and carrying a Malaysian passport, as my father was a Malaysian citizen. My mother, who was a Singaporean, was equally as clueless under these circumstances. It was not until I was 21 years old that I find out that I had received an enlistment notice to serve in the military here. But by that time, it was already too late because that notice was two years old. I had completed my undergrad studies in the UK at that point. And I came back to what was effectively the shock of my life. I asked my parents, what was I supposed to do under these circumstances? And then they had only one thing to say, Douglas, never return to Singapore ever again. So that lasted until 2016. When I asked myself, why am I running away why do I feel like I am a fugitive of the law when effectively I've done nothing wrong? How about I just come, do the right thing, own up and serve my time in the army? Wouldn't that, things, wouldn't that make things right again? People advise me, Douglas, the law is not on your side. You may come back to some very severe punishment. I replied, at this moment in time, I believe that I cannot live if I had not cleared my conscience. I have to come back and do what I need to do. So in March, 2016, I returned back to Singapore and I enlisted. And that was more than 12 years later. I entered into the Singapore Civil Defense Force in July 2016. And I served as a medic at the 995 Emergency Call Center. So that was my national service. In 2018, I completed my national service, having served two years and given up everything, my family, my career, my home, to come and do what I thought was right. But before I completed my service, I received the notice that I was charged for this offense. And this was a building the state courts, which I saw almost every two weeks. And this was one of the most miserable time of my life because I was treated just like a common criminal for doing something that I had no control of. It did not stop there. One does not just suffer the indignation of having to go through this system, but have the national media cover your humiliation. 
This is an article from the Straits Times that appeared on the 22nd of October last year. This is a Chinese newspaper article that appeared. I was just glad that they used a nice picture for my Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, the music had to stop. And as much as you thought that you could get away with what you had not done, or it wasn't as serious, the reality sets in. When you first enter into Changi prison, they strip you down, there are sniffer dogs that try to suss out if you're carrying anything on your person. You're stripped of everything. You're made to do exercises with absolutely no regard to personal modesty. Because guess what? You're not a free person anymore. You're now part of the correction system. So welcome to Changi Prison. You're given prison clothing, shirt, shorts, slippers, a box that contains all your personal belongings, your towel, your soap, your toothbrush, a plastic spoon, a mug, and two blankets. And that's all you have. You don't bring anything in with you. Books come later. They will be dropped off when your parents, if your parents, visit you. This is a view that we never got to see. This is the view of Changi Prison plus the Bee from the outside. But for us, this was our world. You go in the set of cells. Each cell contains eight people. There is no furniture at all in any of these cells. When you sleep, you sleep on the floor. There is no space either. So watch out, don't roll over. You may just get smacked. This is the common area that we see. The roll of cell doors that face each other. But we have no view of it because the spy holes are only for the officers to look in and not for us to look out. So when you're inside, you literally see four walls and nothing else. And you spend 23 hours a day inside your cell. You eat in your cell, you sleep in your cell, you bathe in your cell, and you pass the time in your cell. This is not precisely what it looks inside because there are no photographs that are allowed. But you get a rough idea of the sort of living conditions that we had underwent. Breakfast was the same every day. Four slices of bread, either with butter or jam, and it comes with instant coffee or instant tea. Lunch, perhaps a hot dog, rice, some vegetables, or fish cake, or slow food. Dinner, same thing again, maybe with fish or chicken and a fruit. You are always hungry. You are never full. You keep thinking about how much food you had when you were outside. How you complained when it was not up to your standards. But when you're inside, whatever you're given, 
you swallow because you don't have a choice. In four months, I shed seven kilos by doing nothing. Because in Chinese prison, they don't believe in rehabilitating you. They believe that you are harm to society. And so you are in there to be punished. This is your lot for breaking the law. Be warned. It's not entirely aimless each day. We have activities such as day room where we will play param, watch pre-recorded TV5, read newspapers that are two weeks out of date and are heavily censored. We don't get sports news because they don't want us gambling. This is our yard. I was fortunate. My prison was on the top floor. As a result, I had a yard that when I went out, I could see the sky and the sun. For the first month when I was in there, in November, it rained for almost a whole month. And what that meant was yard got cancelled. So when I finally got my one hour of yard activity, I went out, I saw the blue sky, and I thanked God for his creation. You don't notice these things. You just notice how hot it is, or whether it's hazy, or whether the days are long enough or they're too short. But when you're stripped away, Get absolutely nothing. All of this comes into sharp relief. And obviously, we have counseling. You have these hardened people in there. And suddenly, they're broken. They know that they need a power that's higher than themselves. Because by ourselves, we just can't sustain ourselves. There is no way. Not in that environment. Not under those circumstances. But believe it or not, when it is all quiet, you can hear the still, small voice of God that even the most hardened atheists will then become spiritual. So in the deepest, darkest moments of your life, how do you pull through? The first is make a choice. We all have choices in our life, even when we're faced with this sort of situation. You can choose to feel pity for yourself, or you can choose to rise above your own circumstances. Gratitude cannot be overstated. I was grateful when breakfast came in the morning. I was grateful when I got to shave every Wednesday and every Sunday. I was grateful when they replaced the nets in the basketball court that we could play basketball without having the ball being caught by the side. I was grateful for cellmates who were rational and understanding and considerate. I was grateful for those who regarded their personal hygiene to be a priority. What are you grateful for? It can be just the smallest and most simple things. The third is, know what is important in your life. As MBAs, we have come to become movers and shakers of this world. And we devote ourselves to the pursuit 
of activity. But do you really know what is important in your life? Or who is important in your life? Are you grateful for them? Do you regard them in the same way that they see you? When was the last time you paused? That's one fantastic thing about being in prison. The silver lining is that you have all the time in the world to think and reflect. When you have no pen and no paper, you desperately want to write a letter to let your parents know that you're okay. When you're so desperate to hear from the outside world as to what is going on, but more than that, how people are. What goes on is not important anymore. It's who is in your life that is the most important. Above all, hang on to hope. Know what is important. There's the picture that I took with my parents on the day that I was released. As you can see, I'm wearing the same shirt. When I wear the shirt, I'm reminded. This is the shirt that I wore into prison. This is the shirt that I wore out of prison. The shirt hasn't changed, but I have. That's why I'm grateful for everything. I'm no longer fearful. Because when you go through this and you're able to cling on to hope, that hope is what sustains you. And that hope will give you strength. Whether it is in yourself or in God or in the ones who love you, always remember in your deepest, darkest moments to continue to cling on to that hope above all. Thank you and God bless you.